Good morning, Claudia. How are you? Excellent. Thank you so much, Ken, for uh, inviting me to contribute here. Oh, listen, it's always a pleasure. Uh, for those who don't know Claudia, it's Claudia Kotka. She is, how do I explain you? Uh, let, me, let me think for a second. You're a laser dentist. Uh, people fly to you internationally. You uh, triple master from Michigan, which means you're a government advisor. You're an advisor to the industry. You do public policy. And I don't know what else. I mean, you're like, you, you're just like this triple, multiple threat. Never mind triple threat. You're this <laughs> multiple threat, like they say on the, on the football field. So can you sort of bring us up to speed with all everything that you're doing? Because ultimately, it's going to lead into your presentation. So what's, what's new under the sun with you? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the generous introduction again. You know, we are all unique in terms of our personality as well as uh, professional talents and, um, and the equity that we bring to the profession and to the patients we serve essentially by extension, of course, nationally and internationally. So that said, in terms of um, the subject matter, of course, I've always been interested in physics and uh, optical technology. And I truly believe that uh, optical technology has incredible, unique, intrinsic characteristics as opposed to any other technology as it interacts with tissue. And so that said, uh, there's been some 20 plus years of research and integration, optimization and oral systemic advanced clinical protocols with respect to laser technology, both on the diagnostic end as well as on the interventional end. With respect to the other macro component in terms of healthcare extension, um, interaction of course with the regulatory arm as well as the policy and advisory component, of course, it's important to be well established and be able to interact with the participants of the healthcare commodity space sector. And subject matter experts ought to lead in their respective fields. Yeah, it's interesting because I recently, I know you're um, editorial chief, I think of the AMED or that was some position. Recently, there's been this flurry of articles and other things that you're doing. It's just been everywhere you look, popping out all over the place. What, what's been the uh, what's been the impetus for all of this flurry of activity that you're suddenly involved in? I see. So I've always been involved. It's just sometimes they um, there's a lot going on underneath the surface, if right. you will, and there's more to come on that because yeah. there are appropriately their strategy in terms of and also access to to participation, access to networks and. Um, oftentimes, and unfortunately, and I'm going to now um, apply to our field, you and I both know as clinicians that from a therapeutic perspective and access to care, we would like to have our patients be able to take advantage of innovations very early on. However, oftentimes in realistic infrastructure of exchange, that does not occur. And sometimes it takes even decades for that implementation. Then since we're talking about uh, gender shift, for instance, if I yes. may add, NIDCR, for instance, has had a woman world health model for the past three or four decades from a research perspective. And yet I, uh, the Institute of DC Residentists, we are one of the very few that I know of that have really taken that to heart, customized, implemented that into our patient rendition and access to differentiating in terms of not just correlation or symptom driven therapeutics, but also mechanism driven symptom therapeutics with respect to that application. So um, it's um, the, the, the activity renders sometimes oftentimes in terms of what the world is willing to accept, what the world is willing and courageous to to recognize. Uh, and sometimes it happens by 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 nice pressurized uh, uh, you know, impact in, in, in whatever direct or indirect way. So if you look in the United States, for example, if you look at Congress, the number of women in Congress is, you know, not really reflective of society at large. Yet the World Monetary Fund and UN and other groups, um, they seem to have women leaders. Um, so thanks to Enrico for identifying uh gender parity, gender equity, uh, you know, you can get into the meritocracy aspect of it, but that's usually if you're talking to a patriarch, not somebody else, they, you know, whatever. Um, but you've been in government forever and government doesn't really represent women. There's like, it's, you know, with all due respect, government is usually the old boys. They have a network, you know, they've kept it that way. They foster each other. So how did you achieve, um, not only what you've achieved, but how did you achieve your position? And are people actively working, like yourself, actively working to shift uh, the, the to ignore 
the gender and just bringing qualified people into governance? So one thing I'd like to just highlight is that it's not just about the presence of women, but it's the quality of the presence of women that I think it's important to recognize. That's number one. And that sometimes takes time, unfortunately, but it, we do have to uh, recognize the differentiation and that requirement because competition is about superior excellence in logic and application and expertise, as well as implementation potential. Um, with respect to the government, um, we know that by historic presentation, um, the laws may be formulated, but they're not implemented. Mm -hmm. And so that component takes a massive, I would say, contribution of the rendition, why we don't see things that we ought to see and what we've contributed to. And your last point and your question, I'd like to just leave with that on that point, is that I was invited to do policy work with the American Dental Association during my, between my first and second year at the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. Now, I already had a interest in the law. I had um, deferred law school. My interest was intellectual property specifically because of the innovation interest that has been longitudinal uh, even previous to that. So, so uh, being at the Hubbard University of Michigan, I was given the, I would say, um, allowance to, 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 to have fluid movement within the department of subject matter within the schools um, present under the umbrella of University of Michigan. And that, um, I would say that when I was given that opportunity to come to Washington DC, I took it. I was supposed to be in Milano um, at the time, but uh, I changed flights. And so here we, you know, here I am. And doors open. And I think that, you know, I discussed this before, it's either at, will you pass through it or will you not? And it's not about necessarily the immediate, I would say, um, um, payout that you receive. There has to be a reflection of whether or not does this reflect with what I have been born to impact on? Does this reflect with, what I've been, with the talents that I have been given? And for me, these do come at a natural, I would say, extension. Um, there are, for, of course, opportunities and requirements for uh, knowledge-based um, um, acquisition um, and experience and try and try and try again. Um, you know, one of the areas, one of the things that, for instance, I, I bring up in my um, um, discussions with, for instance, younger experts, not just dentists, but other healthcare experts, is that we have to, as leaders and as subject matter experts, we have to become comfortable with all the elements that really constitute leadership. And that means that I should be feeling comfortable with even reading a legal document. And I have to know really where the premise is because there's something very unique about the subject matter component that any other specialty by extension, law or business or uh, media, let's say, or technology, for instance, computer science will not be able to acquire in their own logic um, as they would if they were in that specific subject matter to which they apply. And so in terms of um, um, interactions, I can't say that um, I had the vision, of course, of, of impacting uniquely. I had always the vision of, uh, of working hard. Um, I didn't always necessarily understand all the rubrics in terms of the, uh, the progression. But um, doors always opened and I always had to make a decision, do I step forward, even though I may not have the resources, I may not have an immediate payout, but do I impact, do I generously offer because it's, re it's a requirement and it's a necessary demand from the public or for the even individualized patients. So I think that we do that as representatives of the oral health um, subject matter to our individualized uh, patients, but also by extension, the community. And now it has become more even of a global reach uh, yeah. in terms of impact. So this, I don't want to go too far afield. You're now a professor at Liberty University. So do you yes, like have I, to wear the hats and the robes and the whole business? Is that? Yes, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, engaging in that. And uh, it was a very interesting thing for me. Um, it's a really a privilege to be able to have a presence in terms of the, some of the elements which 
uh, constituted what why I had left communist Romania, my family has, and of course being blessed to have been accepted in the United States. But by extension, um, I was very interested to also contribute to the public health component from the oral systemic aspect mm -hmm. um, that I've had been involved in the last 20 years after or even started right as I was graduating from dental school. So um, yes, I engage in terms of subject matter with um, health sciences and what better, what better contribution than to have the oral component be brought in more profoundly from a perspective of a public health perspective and view. And so yes, as a toxicologist, environmental health scientist, and public health by extension at University of Michigan in terms of curriculum at the School of Public Health had basically was integrated within uh, the auspices of the medical school. So the rendition was always a very global perspective of the human um, equation, if you will, of application, as well as, of course, uh, the renditions in terms of population, uh, population differentiation of um, comorbidities or perhaps the therapeutics. So you've got this constellation of interests, uh, academic uh, wherewithal. Uh, you're obviously beyond insightful. You are a master of literally so many different areas. So, so what are you going to talk about in, Calig in Caliglieria, Chia? What, what, how do you distill this down to a, well, not a short presentation, but a presentation among 78 other presenters? I mean, how do you just, this is like, it really is a distillation. How do you put all this in one place? So one of my passions has been, as I mentioned, laser technology. And um, one of the, I would say, opportunities we have now with the technology support is the laser microsurgery protocols that I've been able to customize and, of course, develop and promote from DC residentes here in DC Metro globally, and essentially um, focusing on how the uh, technology integration from a microscopic component um, with the laser uh, capacity uh, to interact with tissue. And that can be modified, if you will, or packaged in a medical device uh, for visualization uh, perspective. And that is one topic I will be speaking on, micro uh, visualization for um, for, of course, absorption information in real time. And we know that there's a lot of technologies and optical physics that can actually allow us to do that in real time. No longer do we have to do more invasive CT scanning, if you will, where you can actually see uh, things in real time with non-invasive approaches, like OTC, for instance. Um, optical coherence tomography as an example. And then of course, we're learning to or taking into adaptation by the actual intervention component. So now that you've seen what's going on at the tissue level um, and a more microscopic uh, rendition, if you will, as opposed to one-to-one -one ratio, now we can of course also utilize other compositions or parameters of laser technologies that actually can um, target the necessary solutions required from that particular abnormality. And that is one of the things that I've been focused on for the past 20 some years. And I will bring some of that, um, I would say knowledge and contribution and expertise uh, to that program. So I'm gonna look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Um, I have to admit a lot of this is like, I need to think about, I'm sure anybody hearing this needs to think about it. It's so, it's so dense, so intense. Uh, in the scope of what you bring to the bring to the subject, um, I know that lasers. I'm, I'm intrigued. You just said something interesting: lasers for diagnosis versus using cone beam or using 3D computer um, tomology. Really, like that's where lasers are headed. You'll be able to use it on that level to make diagnosis. So very, very well pointed out. As a matter of fact, um, that's where, where laser technologies have been all along. It's a matter for us to recognize, recognize uh, you know, the capacity. And let me just say this, from a toxicology perspective, um, one of the things that are is important to highlight and was recently, for instance, um, brought to more, I would say, um, academic forum through the American Dental Research Program Symposium at the AADOCR, which is the new AADR by, um, by terminology ch name change, but will be also promoted um, um, in the pharma uh, pharmacology, therapeutics, and toxicology group of the International Association of Dental Research in China, of course, is going to be virtual. And that is, how do we really distinguish which clinical protocols have less or um, uh, more or minimal clinical toxicity requirements when applied uh, as opposed to other devices. And that's one of the points of 
a message. Optical laser technologies actually carry very minimal, if any, clinical toxicity profiles or indices, as opposed to other medical devices, such as medications or other types of interventions, even from the mechanics technology, for instance. So that is really where the different um, course sciences um, depth of recognition, um, principles and fundamentals um, of how uh, things work at the microscopic level, at the nano, first of all, at the nano level, atomic yeah. level, um, cellular level, um, and cellular molecular level, and then adapting that, of course, to the more macro tissue representation of what phenotypically we see and we treat as clinicians. And having that depth and the coordination, I always like to uh, remind, I think, uh, the community at large is that clinicians really are scientists. It's just we have the privilege of actually interacting with our, uh, with our uh, patient. And so that makes it a really wonderful opportunity. So I'm going to, the last question, I'm going to violate the Privacy Act. Well, mind you, not really. You, when we spoke about when we could talk, you had a patient flying in to work, be worked on from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. So let me see if I can add that on my fingers. That's nine hours, okay? I assume with a lunch break. Um, what, what were you doing on a patient for that long in a laser aspect? I, it just, it fascinated me that somebody would fly in from around the world somewhere and you would work on them for nine hours. I still, like, what were you doing from laser technology on that patient? Again, privacy, we, if I can't do it, that's fine. But what's the scope of what you do in your clinic? The scope really is um, comprehensive diagnostics, of course, in terms of from an etiology perspective, mm -hmm. a cause mechanism, understanding of comprehension of how did it, how did the abnormalities happen to be? And we know that in the head and neck, there's a lot of systemic conduit of incipient um, centers of abnormalities starting elsewhere, but presenting in the oral uh, segment. Right. So from comprehensive um, diagnostics, then we, of course, then we delineate in terms of interventional requirement. And if, for instance, we're looking at interdisciplinary prosthodontic rehabilitation, we start with the nephrologic and the head and neck, skeletal, neuromuscular position, which we have the opportunity to improve on during the intervention requirement. Now, um, then, of course, more specifically to the laser um, references we've made in this particular conversation. Um, for instance, during the delivery process of lithium day silicate, um, which gives an incredible opportunity for adhesion potential and stability with time that really extends beyond even what is statistically has been documented in literature, um, provided that, of course, we have occlusion appropriate and as well as the dynamics of, of that occlusion appropriately balanced and appropriately rendered. But from perspective of control mechanisms of bleeding potential, sometimes uh, I have seen patients, for instance, um, um, who are um, have a systemic hormonal profile for whatever reason it can be related to gender differentiation or it can be related to a medical a medical cocktail or medicine cocktail, if you will, rendition. And um, one afternoon when you're delivering the upper arch, everything is fine. It has been fine for the past, you know, six months or four months or nine months, uh, depending on how long the case has been. And then the next week when they see you see them for delivery on the lower arch, suddenly there's breathing and probing and there's basically contamination. He must, um, uh, he must, uh, um, uh, requirement for control. If there wasn't laser optical technology, um, packaging and accessibility to control that heme, you really would have to intervene from a surgical perspective where now you have just will be um, essentially having to deal with a new position of the margin, a new position of the gingival uh, uh, structural attachment and so on. And laser technology can actually become so microscopically pointed and rendered without even having any of those really be at risk. And yet still be able to transfer that adhesion expectation. So when we look now, and this, I've just given you an example of clinical toxicity index, where laser choice of protocol would render less liability in the amount of time that is most efficacious and most expected, and you know, of course, um, needed by patients, uh, as opposed to additional adjunct requirements, which would 
not only put at risk the end product to some distinction, but at the same time uh, require more, more effort on all parts. You are something, I mean, you're amazing. Um, this was supposed to be simple questions on your presentation. I have, we're, we're nowhere, I mean, this is hysterical. <laughs> it's like none of these have turned out to be focused on the, uh, on the uh, actual, actual presentation in Chia. Well, uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. I need to go to the dictionary now to look up all of these words. Um, rendition, I'm trying to figure out rendition, but I'll, we'll work on it. Nonetheless, a pleasure. Enjoy your weekend or what's left of it. And um, quick question, just again, we're, this is going off like crazy. Your sister, you have such, you such, you talk about her with such um, affection. Um, I just, in, in, in 30 seconds or less, she is you, but in a legal perspective, right? That's what she does. Is that correct? Well, I'm not going to put words in her mouth because she's definitely an attorney and definitely independent. Um, but yes, um, she's an attorney and she's been basically, her, her dream was to be, uh, to have some kind of, um, I would say, contribution in the human rights perspective. And she does right. it from a congressional watchdog perspective here in Washington, D.C. And of course, has an international um, um, spectrum of reference. She's also um, did a ton of research on her thesis uh, at Michigan back in 19, you know, 1999 on the U.S.-Romanian relations, of course, um, and also studied at Oxford, but essentially continued her passion here in Washington, D.C. She's a litigator. This is what she really wanted to do, right. which is difficult to, you know, to, to for those of us who, who, um, are familiar with the with the disciplines it's difficult to intersect litigation with the human rights and and and, and policy perspective for protecting rights of individuals um but i would say that she does have an dream job and uh um privilege to contribute uh to individuals here in the united states as well as internationally as well so thank you so much for that recognition oh no, she's she's like the two of you are like the dynamic duo you know ma and pa kotka must be just thrilled they have these two brilliant <laughs> kind. really holy cow you're very okay. kind you're oh very no kind. no she's i've read this stuff she's amazing i just i was really taken aback when i, I when you mentioned her i just did some you know i did some research on her bibliography or biography bibliography her biography and i was like wow the two of you are unreal so in any case thank you uh it's still sunday there's still time go enjoy the rest of the day i'm sure the cherry blossoms are out all over washington right now or they're falling <laughs> off i don't know but nonetheless thank you thank you looking forward to the presentation can't wait to hear the focus of this because even in endodontics lasers are taken over it took 25 years but that's the way it is so it's fantastic Claudia, thank you. We'll talk soon, okay? You have a wonderful day. All thank right. You, thank you so much. Can I appreciate that? I want to just extend um, commandments to, of course, uh, the uh, Dr. and Nikolai for oh, absolutely. taking on this and your support with uh, Biden Nexus is really fantastic. So, well, Enrico, I, I had a chance to meet him. I, I don't want to go off too far afield, but what a, what a um, passionate, driven person he just travels all the time to pursue educational opportunities what an interesting interesting man anyway i will see you shortly thank you so much be well okay you take care bye bye claudia okay bye